Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back once again to the Siege of Vrax. We've been dealing with the Adeptus Astartes for a while, but now that the Space Marines decided to simply go home after not quite completing their mission, shall we say, it is time once again to return to the Death Court of Krieg, which found itself in a somewhat confusing position. They had, of course, been carrying out small-scale offensive operations against the second defensive line now for quite a while. In fact, this was now Year 9. At this point, the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army was supposed to be entrenched against the inner defensive line, the Curtain Walls, the Red Line, and uh, yet... They were still stuck on the second one, and there was really no indication of it cracking any time soon. And now that their Astartes support had arrived and left again, that did not look as if it was going to change any time soon. Undoubtedly, Lord Commander Jolkin had hoped that the Dark Angels would have lent a little bit more direct aid in the breaking of the defences, but they had simply contended themselves with burning down the starport, and also burning down the Death Corps' potential access to the starport. <laughs> I can only imagine Julka's face, probably awoken in the middle of the night on his headquarter on Thracia Primaris, by an aide telling him that, Sir, the Dark Angels, they've, uh, they've taken the Vraxian starport. Oh, good, grand, when can we use it? Um, well, sir, they've destroyed the bridge that's connecting to it. Oh, drats, well, we can rebuild those. Um, yes, they've also burned the entire starport to the ground, sir. What? And then they left. Um, they informed us to inform you that, um, the mission has been completed, sir. I imagine what ensued then is lots of loud crashing noises as the Lord Commander throws various objects around the room. Imperial High Command had undoubtedly um, hoped for more, but nevertheless, the Dark Angel's stay, brief though it had been, had undoubtedly succeeded in putting a fair few Vraxians into the ground, and if nothing else, that would weaken their positions at least a little bit. And something clearly had to be done to get this campaign back on track, and as we have previously seen, Lord Commander Julka was of course a brilliant strategist, and so he came up with the ultimate plan to simply once again hit the Braxians with absolutely goddamn everything, but this time he was also going to be throwing in the kitchen sink. Ah, uh, well, that is a bit of an understatement. The plan that Lord Commander Jolka came up with this time was, in essentiality, that very thing, throw everything at the bad people, but the sheer quantity of mud that was to be flung at the wall this time around was in a league of its own. This would be the big push, the great gambit designed to end the war as swiftly and brutally as possible. and. He was really in a position where the war needed to be ended soon. The Lord Commander's star was not exactly in ascendance over at Segmentum Command, and he could not expect any further reinforcements beyond the replacements of the troops he already had. He had of course received a further Lion Corps, the 46th, with three siege regiments, but that was also probably all he was going to see, and with the Astartes reinforcements proving to be, once again, not quite what High Command had expected, it was up to the good old-fashioned guardsmen to put it all right. Thusly, Lord Commander Julka began preparing a conventional offensive of unconventional scale. At this point in time, the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army's heavy artillery reserves remained more or less the same as it had previously. The new Lion Corps didn't really bring anything in the way of additional heavy ordnance along with it, meaning the army had in effect some 70,000 heavy artillery pieces. And these are the heavy pieces, the Earthshakers and the Bombards. The various Lion Corps of course have their own lighter artillery pieces like quad launchers and so on, but this was again the heavy stuff. So 70,000 guns. What could be done with 70,000 artillery pieces? Well, 
One of the primary problems with the second defensive line was, of course, the fact that it was so heavily entrenched with permacree trenches, bunkers, and all manners of nonsense. If one were to throw an absolutely absurd quantity of high explosive at this problem, the problem might just simply disappear. Now, one would require quite literally a mountain of artillery rounds to achieve this, but uh, that was a question of logistics. <laughs> Not necessarily one of feasibility. And of course, Mere questions of logistics was not something that a Lord Commander should have to spend too much time thinking about. It was Commander Zulka's job to come up with the grandiose plan, to have the ambition and the foresight required to envisage such a massive display of firepower. It was for lesser minds in the logistical core to realise it. And how big of a job could it possibly be after all. All he was asking for was for a small four-day barrage that was supposed to go on for around the clock for every gun in the besieging army. All 70,000 of them. <laughs> uh, let's, let's have a look at this uh, small and easy to carry out task, shall we? So, your average Earthshaker, the workhorse of the Imperial Army, is able to fire off some 1,000 rounds before the barrel needs changing. With proper preparation and free operation maintenance, you can probably slap on another 500 rounds to that number, so let's say 1,500 rounds before an Earthshaker's barrel needs to be replaced. In the case of the Bombard, the number is considerably lower, maybe around 200 to 500 rounds, due to the considerably larger shells. Not to mention, of course, various other parts that will start exhibiting certain signs of wear and tear, shall we say, after having fired off hundreds of kilograms of high explosives. Such things as breech blocks, springs, recoil dampeners, <laughs> crew. In all due honesty, that was probably one of the most problematic elements since those damn things need such things as food and rest and sleep and other such useless things like ear protectors. <laughs> Spoiled brats if you ask me, but nevertheless, standards must be upheld. Anyway, why am I telling you any of this? Well, since we don't know the exact ratio of Earthshakers to Bombards, we're gonna ballpark it and say that each gun has roughly the same rate of wear and tear on the barrel. Not entirely correct, but good enough for now. The logistical officers on Vrax estimated that to keep every gun firing for the full three-day period and to ensure they would be able to continue to lay fire on the enemy after the initial bombardment and, of course, a little bit in the way of dueling with the enemy's guns before the operation, each gun would need at least two spare barrels in addition to the one already mounted on the gun and to make sure they would like to have three barrels in store for each and every gun. That's 210,000 artillery barrels that would need a requisitioning from Krieg, transportation to Krieg, then transportation to the surface, transportation to the front line, and then of course storage relatively nearby the guns. And that of course is just the barrels. Already you can start to see the potential challenges in uh, Lord Commander Zulka's grand plan. And speaking of challenges, we have of course not yet arrived at the most important point, because whilst having spare barrels is certainly a good thing, it won't help you out too much unless you've actually got some ammunition to fire from said barrels. The Krieg logistical officers, of whom I made a big song and dance in a previous video talking about how vast the logistical apparatus was from the bombardment cause, and you're about to see them earning their pay, estimated that the army would require, at a bare minimum, 80 million shells to continue a steady pace of bombardment throughout the four days. 
if the artillery was expected to provide further fire support to the offensive operations after this bombardment, and potentially also carrying out some long-range artillery duels with the Vraxian artillery preceding the operation, then they would prefer to have in excess of 100 million shells ready and stored on the planet. To put this already rather sizable number into yet further perspective, an Earthshaker round weighs 38 kilograms. The shell of a Bombard can weigh up to 400, but in the name of sobriety, let's assume that all of these rounds are Earthshaker rounds. That would mean that the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army was about to receive a shipment of 3.8 million metric tons of high-explosive artillery ammunition. Well then, Jolka's plan might be characteristically simple and essentially boil down to little more than pick up hammer and then subsequently use hammer or nuts, but the sheer monumental size of the hammer he was preparing to drop might just make any other concerns completely and utterly pointless. And to make it all infinitely more interesting, Julka had also managed to pull off a bit of a ploy with all of this. Entirely by accident, mind you, but it bears mentioning. As you can probably imagine, the preparations for this big push was quite the tremendous task in and of itself. The mere act of moving such an epic quantity of high explosive from point A to B is challenging, shall we say. Normally there are two bulk freighters in orbit above Vrax. This is more than enough to keep the entire army supplied for weeks at the very least and possibly months depending on the general level of activity. In preparation for a great push, however, there were six of these gigantic void crafts in orbit, all of them working as fast as they possibly could to pour the manpower reserves, the ammunition, the spare parts, and all of the various other things the army was going to need onto the planet below, pushing the logistical system to the absolute bursting point and well beyond it. If the Siege Army had access to the Vraxian starports, it would have been a nightmarish task. But without it, and with access to only improvised facilities originally designed to move less than a third of this volume, the successful completion of the task could be more closely compared to getting viciously butt-fucked in a dark alley by a crack cocaine fueled hippogriff. Dark, scary, seemingly unending, and supremely unlikely. And odd as it may sound, the sheer impossibility of the task was actually going to work to the besiegers' advantage. There was so much that needed doing. New ammunition stores would have to be planned, new underground bunkers would have to be excavated, new maintenance shops would have to be set up to prepare the guns and to do the running repairs required. To put it bluntly and briefly, every single part of the Siege Army's infrastructure would require expanding. The repair capacity, the medical capacity, the storage capacity, the transportation capacity, all of it would need to be built out. And this was of course going to take a lot of time, which was the thing that ended up working to the Siege Army's benefit. The Vraxians, of course, noticed that something was up. The amount of traffic on the other side of the battlefield was increasing exponentially, and kept increasing. And so the Vraxians hunkered down and waited for all hell to break loose. And they waited, 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 and they waited. Months dragged by, and... Nothing particularly interesting seemed to be happening, and this constant state of nothing was driving some Vraxian commanders absolutely insane. 
the Cardinal amongst them. Yet more reinforcements was pushed up to the front because it was clear that the Krieg Death Corps was preparing for something big, and the Vraxians would have to put everything they had in stopping it. Yet more infantry was allocated to the front line, yet more reserves were pushed up, yet more artillery pieces were deployed and engaged in ever-escalating artillery duels with the Krieg artillery. And yet still, the time dragged on and dragged on, and no matter how ridiculous it might seem at the beginning, eventually you get used to practically everything and the Vraxians started lowering their guard. Clearly, something was coming, but not in their wildest dreams could they imagine the sheer quantity of fuck that was about to descend upon them. And that was going to be a very costly lesson for the defenders, because no matter how vast the preparations were, sooner or later, they'd be complete. Sooner or later, those 100 million shells would be in place. Sooner or later, those 210,000 barrels would be ready. Sooner or later, 70,000 heavy artillery pieces would be maintained and prepared for a 96 hour long bombardment. At precisely 0898 millennia 41, a small red switch was flipped over in the headquarters command bunker of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army. This caused thousands of small lamps located in battery dugouts up and down the front to blink into red strobing light. For the next 96 hours, virtually all communications amongst the artillery batteries would take place in one of two forms either a light signal or written instructions, because the event the small blinking red light heralded was going to ensure that no one would be hearing anything for quite a while. Meanwhile, in the Vraxian Citadel, a few dozen operators sat in the primary alert and response centre. It was their job to gather reports from the front and formulate responses to any Krieg actions, along with directing the Vraxian response, whatever it may be, to wherever it may be needed. Due to the constant artillery shells flying back and forth, even during the calmest of periods, they communicated primarily via Vox cables, dug it deep underground and encased in permacrete trenches. This was due to the simple fact that any Vox cable stretched above ground was temporary at best and radio signals, whilst they could usually get through the interference, they were a less than entirely private means of communication. Thusly, the operators sat before what were essentially good old fashioned switchboards, with little lamps of their own indicating which sector and which commander was calling. As you can imagine, the place could get pretty busy on occasion, but right now it was half empty. Despite the escalating artillery activity, the front had been quiet, relatively speaking, for ages and no one expected it to change anytime soon. There were even rumours circulating that maybe the reason for the Krieg movement was not because of a build-up, but rather because of a withdrawal. All the trucks, they supposed, were ferrying men and material away rather than to the front. After all, since nothing had happened for so long, they couldn't possibly be hoarding supplies. It had been months. No one could possibly need that much in the way of supplies. All in all, the mood was pretty good. Then, a small light turned on at the top of one of the switchboards. Nothing unusual about it. it, could be a status report, a request for additional supplies or instructions mayhaps. But as the operator reached for the Vox input, another light winked on. Then another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another, until the entire board was beaming bright. This, on the other hand, was unusual. For several seconds, many simply just stood there and wondered what the hell? Electrical error? An overload somewhere? They couldn't all be communiques, right? But they were. 
Overseers quickly re-established control and the stratagem officers began attempting to establish a picture of what the fuck was happening. One thing, however, was made supremely clear. The besiegers were not withdrawing. Instead, they appear to have launched an unprecedented artillery barrage all along the front line. The operators were receiving reports from every single sector, and all of them saying the exact same thing. Everything had been ticking along as usual, as it had been for months, the occasional shell here and there. And then suddenly, uniformly and without warning, the ground had literally begun to shake. The pace of artillery fire had increased exponentially along the entirety of the front line. It certainly was an extensive barrage, but it was just yet another barrage. This did not trouble the operational planners overmuch. The defensive line had been under practically continuous artillery fire for nine years. This was nothing new. What was important now was to formulate a response, because this was undoubtedly the preliminary barrage for an attack. They needed to organize reserves and prepare forces for a counterattack, and... One of the lights winked out. The operator hadn't gotten to that one yet, and... Another one, further down the line. An error? No. There was plenty of operators receiving panicked reports. This wasn't a faulty wire. And as if to emphasize that, yet another light winked out. The only explanation for an active wire to go dark like that was if the communication had been cut off at the source. That shouldn't happen. All frontline commanders were under strict instructions to never break off a communique before they had talked to an operator. Doing so would be, by the operator, considered an indication that the bunker had been compromised in some way. And if it hadn't been compromised, then the response team would be swift in putting the commander's head on a pike to ensure that nobody else would be so careless. The only other alternative was if the wire had been cut, but that was impossible. It was located dozens of meters below ground, and the box set itself was set deep in a command bunker somewhere. It couldn't just have vanished. Unless, perhaps, this bombardment wasn't quite like the others, after all. Back in the Krieg artillery lines, the highly unusual bombardment was just that. Now, Firing a heavy artillery piece is never a particularly comfortable experience. The noise, the reverberations, the hard physical labor that it is, lugging shells around, etc., all combine to make the firing of a heavy artillery piece an exceedingly uncomfortable experience. But that is when you're firing one gun. In this case, the entirety of the army was firing every piece at their disposal. Almost 70,000 pieces. The noise was not merely deafening, it was downright destructive. Krieg commanders had levied bombardments of this scale before, and they knew what to expect. Sound baffles had been constructed in all of the various artillery dugouts to try and prevent the more destructive effects of the constant noise. Additionally, earthworks had been placed in strategic locations to try and guide the worst of the explosive energy up and away from the batteries, rather than having it bounce back and forth until eventually it got lethal. The artillerymen were also issued extra noise-protecting air muffles, and they were to be rotated out on a bi-hourly basis to try and prevent the most serious of damages. The artillery crewmen were also instructed to keep their mouths open at all times, and preferably to shout as loud as they could at all times in an attempt to equalize the pressure differences that would otherwise prove quite fatal. But despite all of the precautions, the attrition rate amongst the crew members was still well north of unfortunate. Blood vessels burst, as did eardrums, accidents happened, and kept happening. The ground was literally shaking under the ferocity of the bombardment, which makes handling heavy artillery ammunition somewhat dodgy, shall we say. 
Yet further accidents happened, sometimes leading to the loss of entire crews and guns. Quartermasters would run ragged, clearing out the casualties, both the wounded and the dead, assigning replacement personnel and seeing to those who had been incapacitated. The Engineering Corps were working just as hard, replacing those guns that had been lost either due to enemy shelling or accidents, moving those in need of repairs and maintenance out of the line, and moving other guns back up again as replacements. The workshops were working full time to keep the guns firing. The engineers had to keep up a breakneck speed for the full four days to ensure that the bombardment would not falter and would not halt even for a moment. It was promising to be an extraordinarily uncomfortable 96 hours for pretty much everyone except, unusually enough, the poor bloody infantry who, for once, had actually got to the better end of the deal. They were all sat in nice, new, freshly dug underground bunkers. These new underground shelters were one of the necessary expansions of the forward lines, since if the infantry were located above ground in their trenches during the bombardment, they would be just as deaf as their brethren in the artillery, and sending deaf men against heavy machine guns, whilst it might have its benefits, seemed somewhat unnecessary, even by Krieg standards. And so, for once, probably the first and, in all due likelihood also, the last time in the entire Siege of Rax, the Krieg Guardsman was probably the least worried, least inconvenienced, and least troubled group of individuals on the whole planet. And since these were Krieg Guardsmen, I am entirely sure that they hated every single second of it. But fortunately, after a mere 96 hours, they could get out of their nice, comfy, warm, relatively well sound insulated bunkers and up into the trenches, where every few dozen meters there was a small wooden ladder leading up into the comforting embrace of No Man's Land and the surety that sacrifice in the Emperor's name was the greatest achievement any member of the Death Corps of Krieg could ever hope for. And there would be plenty of sacrifice to go around, as the Siege Army mustered every ounce of strength left in it, mobilizing a full two million guardsmen to launch continuous attacks across the entirety of the Vraxian defensive lines, or at the very least, what was left of them. As you can probably imagine, after dumping some 8.3 million metric tons of high explosives on well, pretty much anything, to be entirely honest, it will be somewhat diminished in stature afterwards, and this held true for the Vraxian defences as well, as in certain sectors, they had simply just disappeared. And I am sure that all the Krieg officers let out a collective sigh of relief as they received reports indicating that it hadn't been a complete waste of ammunition. And while some sectors continued to offer stubborn resistance in areas where the enemy had been so lucky as to avoid receiving a high explosive package down through whatever ventilation shafts were found in their bunker systems, but in other areas the Death Corps were making considerable gains. The enemy were either reduced to defending themselves from improvised positions and shell holes, hastily constructed barricades, etc., and in yet other sectors, the Krieg Death Corps advanced essentially unopposed, where the enemy had quite simply ceased to exist. And, of course, on the absolute other extreme, there are also areas in which the Krieg assaults collapsed entirely. Mostly, once again, due to... Not poor, because that would uh, indicate displeasure slash criticism of the higher command structure, which is of course impossible, but rather incomplete reconnaissance data suggested that there was a weakness in Sector 5045, and the 158th Regiment was ordered to attack it whereupon the 158th Regiment was pinned down by dozens of heavy weapons batteries and subsequently annihilated by traitor artillery barrages. 
incomplete intelligence. But examples of incomplete intelligence notwithstanding, the Death Corps was making gains, more gains than they had done in quite literally years at this point, and they were making solid inroads at several points in the second defensive line. No clear breakthroughs as yet, but they had already established several solid footholds. Therefore, the order went down to send in the second wave to follow in the first, ensure that the footholds remained in Imperial hands and, preferably, ensure the breakthrough. That second part of the objective, however, was going to prove rather difficult. The four-day-long bombardment had succeeded in severely reducing and in areas completely shattering the outer defences. However, it was also a four-day-long bombardment, and the firing of some 70,000 heavy guns over the course of 96 hours is not exactly a stealthy endeavour. By the end of the bombardment, the Vraxians were under absolutely no illusions as to what must be coming next, and had prepared accordingly. There was little in the way of opportunity for withdrawing forces already deployed to the forward lines for obvious reasons, however, virtually all reserve personnel, with the exception of a small skeleton crew kept back at the inner defensive line just in case, were now organised into rapid response formations. Many of these units had already served in more or less this exact role already, consisting primarily of motorised and mechanised regiments. They had stood by in reserve, ready to respond to any Krieg offensive actions. But, in addition to these forces, any and all additional troops, being primarily infantry troops in Origins, were now also issued with motorised and or mechanised means of transport, turning them into ad hoc mechanised and or motorised formations. Obviously, they would be somewhat severely lacking in training in how to operate many of these vehicles, and even more severely lacking in the training required to operate them effectively under combat conditions, but considering the circumstances, any additional sliver of mobility that could be squeezed out of upgrading these formations was desperately needed. Due to the Cardinal's paranoia, far too many of Rax's defenders had been assigned to what was now the front line, and with but a handful of exceptions, all of these units were now heavily engaged and in no position to attempt any sort of organised withdrawal, without the risk of being overrun and annihilated. In other words, the defenders were not in an ideal position, but so far, these primarily ad hoc formations had been effective in stimming further Krieg advances and in the handful of areas where the Vraxians had almost been shattered, the Alpha Legion had stepped in to prevent any full-scale collapse of the front line. Thusly, even after a full week of combat, the Death Corps, despite holding several solid footholds, had not succeeded in creating a conclusive breakthrough. And time was once again becoming an issue. The Death Corps had cut well and truly into their just-in-case reserves of artillery ammunition, and it wasn't all that easy to bring up fresh reserves either. The long straining and tormented logistical network was at the absolute breaking point. After weeks and in many cases months of heroic efforts, both men and materiel were just about ready to give up the ghost. The various transport battalions were each losing dozens of vehicles every day due to mechanical failure. And to make matters worse, many of these vehicles were considered complete write-offs, with many trucks having been driven to the point where their wheels were practically falling off the chassis due to the insane delivery schedules heaped upon them by high command. Meanwhile, the Adeptus Mechanicus mass locomotion engine was still trucking along, although even it was starting to show signs of wear and tear. The Adepts manning it demanded that if the vehicle could not be brought off the line entirely, then at the very least it must be brought in for extensive and emergency maintenance as soon as possible.
and even at the front line, exhaustion was slowly but surely starting to set in. Even the men of Krieg will eventually start getting rather tired after a week of near continuous offensive operations, especially when there wasn't a whole lot of games to show for it. The 88th, the Imperial Guard Siege Army was quite simply beginning to run out of steam. They did, however, have one last card to play. It was a long shot, but the hope was that several fresh regiments arriving just now from Krieg would provide the last bit of impetus needed to finally break through the deadlock. It certainly was a long shot, as these were essentially green troops, although green by Krieg standards certainly means something quite different than by most regimental standards. Nevertheless, High Command's expectations were somewhat subdued, but there was nothing to be lost by trying. Or, at the very least, nothing that High Command put all too much in the way of value on. At this point during the siege, the lives of young Krieg's guardsmen were cheap indeed. The commander of one of these fresh regiments, the 468th, was one Colonel Attus, a man that had earned himself a reputation as a bit of a troublemaker back on Krieg. A so-called... independent thinker. Usually, such disruptive elements would be shunted off out of the way and into the combat engineers or death riders, where the problem of their initiative usually solved itself by a good old-fashioned enemy action. But young Atus's rebellious streak had only started to show after his deployment as a member of an infantry regiment. And despite his free-thinking ways, he climbed quite speedily up the command ladder. He was pretty much always just one step ahead of a court-martial for his various creative interpretations of orders, but he also delivered results wherever he went. He also collected letters of complaint, condemnation, and general censure in such quantities that there was a rumour going around suggesting he was entirely self-supplied with toilet paper. But, oh well. Details. He and his regiment was assigned to the new 46th Lion Corps, where he immediately set about earning his reputation by lying, cheating, and stealing considerable quantities of light and heavy artillery ammunition for his regiment. It turns out that the colonel had, for some mysterious reasons, arrived at the conclusion that High Command's strategy of hurling men at heavy machine gun positions was somehow ineffective. A baffling and absurd leap of logic, of course, but nevertheless, the Colonel had decided to try something slightly different. The Colonel had planned a nighttime operation, something the Death Corps was not overly fond of. Attacking at night or even just maneuvering smacked too much of hesitation and an unwillingness to face one's enemy in the open. Of course, there were parts of the Death Corps that often operated during the night, for example, the combat engineers, in other words, the more dubious parts of the Corps, but to see a mainline regiment resort to such actions that, frankly, bordered on the edge of trickery, hmm, most dubious indeed. But clearly, Colonel Attias didn't care overmuch about what was and wasn't proper, and so he laid his little plan whilst ensuring that his commanders knew only about the general outlines. He was, for example, to launch an attack at dawn on 12.48.22, millennia 41. He neglected to mention that he had appropriated additional supplies for his regiment, but High Command doesn't need to know everything now, do they? And besides, a dawn attack was entirely proper. What he did not mention to his commanders was that he was to deploy the forward elements of his regiment during the preceding night. This was what the additional ammunition was for. He had planned for a large drum fire barrage to last throughout most of the night. 
during which he would personally lead the vanguard of his regiment out into no man's land, crawling in a most cowardly fashion on their bellies across no man's land, taking great pains not to be spotted by the enemy. Now, just to be clear, this idea in and of itself is not really new for the Death Corps. The idea of infiltrating enemy lines during the night is not necessarily a novelty, it is something they would rather avoid, but it was a tactic, and it had been tried previously on the Vrax, but without a whole lot of success. The main difference here lay in the fact that this was not an infiltration assault, this was a full-scale mass bayonet charge. The infiltration into No Man's Land was also not exactly standard. The Death Corps demanded that if any forces were to try and infiltrate enemy lines whilst those lines were under heavy artillery fire, they should maintain at least 300 to 400 meters distance, so as to avoid being decimated by their own artillery. Now, you might think that half a kilometer odd sounds like an awful lot of distance, but, well, these are cannons firing from several kilometers away. One tiny error in the targeting data can produce rather catastrophic consequences. Colonel Attius, on the other hand, led his personal command squad and the lead elements of the 468th Regiment to within 100 meters of the enemy's forward lines. There is a military term called Danger Close. That's when you're so close to the artillery strike you're calling in that there is a possibility that the shell will find you rather than the enemy. 100 meters is pushing the definition of danger close well and truly into the territory of suicidal. However, Colonel Attis was not necessarily in a hurry to go shake hands with Big E himself, and he had carefully planned the operation. He was supremely confident in the abilities of his own artillery officers, whom he had selected personally. Additionally, he had spent the last few days perusing the various independent artillery companies nearby his regiments, going over the history of their command staffs, and getting to know them better over a bottle of contraband or two. He had worked out which independent regiments were open to a bit of creative accounting when it came to where their shells were utilized, and, perhaps even more importantly, which companies could be counted on to not dump their artillery grenades a hundred meters short of the target. And it would appear that Colonel Attis had chosen wisely, as none of his men were molested by friendly artillery shelling. Then, at a predetermined time, just before dawn, the artillery barrage lifted for a moment and then rolled deeper into the enemy's trenches in an effort to cut off further reinforcements. At the same time, the Krieg guardsmen that had been hiding out in no man's land got to their feet and rushed towards the enemy's trenches. Surprise was total. By the time the Vraxians emerged from their dugouts, the men of Krieg were already leaping into their trenches, bayonets first, and within mere minutes the forward lines were overrun. Those defenders that had not yet managed to emerge from their dugouts were now under siege in their own defences, with Krieg guardsmen standing at the top of their dugout stairs, dropping fragmentation grenades and firing lasguns straight down into their previously safe bunkers. The carnage was downright impressive. Usually it was the poor men of Krieg that had to deal with getting one-sidedly slaughtered, but the army boot was well and truly on the other foot now. Hemmed in and trapped, the defenders could only choose between getting gunned down as they attempted to storm out of their dugouts, or wait until the guardsmen above brought up a flamethrower, at which point the Vraxians' once steadfast defences became not only worthless, but actively complicit in the defenders' demise. Of course, as with all things, there were the occasional setbacks. Unfortunately for the 468th, the positions they were currently attacking were partially occupied by Ogren Assault Auxiliars. 
These massive armoured brutes, armed with monstrous melee weaponry, would rampage down the trench lines, murdering anything, friend or foe, that got in their way. And they took a lot of putting down. Pumped full of painkillers and slot battle drugs, they were sent into a frenzied rampage and were completely impervious to pain. Even with fist-sized holes blasted through them, they would just keep going. One such Frankenstein monster came rushing out of the primary command dugout in the centre of the outer trench line. It was greeted by half a dozen Hellgun armed guardsmen. Firing full force, they transformed the brute's torso into a bloody cratered mess, but it didn't even slow down. Acting purely on instinct and rage, the giant horror swung a massive spiked two-handed hammer at the first thing that caught his eye. The impact sent a single, greatcoat-clad figure flying six meters down the trench, until it landed in a broken heap. One of the command squad guardsmen leapt onto the Ogren's back and wedged a crack grenade under its oversized and clearly improvised gas mask. Two seconds later, the giant's head and upper torso disappeared in an explosion of gore. Seconds later, the Ogren's lower half slumped to the ground. The command squad took a moment of time to gather up the broken body of Alpha-1, and for the rest of the attack they would fight on whilst carrying the body of their beloved Colonel Atius. His sacrifice made and service complete, he would not see the eventual success of his regiment, but following his previously issued instructions a signal was sent indicating the success of the vanguard assault. Within an hour, the regiment borrowed Gorgon assault transports. One last gift from their commander rumbled onwards through the gains of the first wave, and by nightfall on that very same day, it was done. No more bunkers or barbed wire stood before the 468 regiments. The Gorgons, wheeling to the left, and to the right continued down the flanks, widening the breach. A battery of quad launchers was swiftly moved into position, and engaging the enemy over open sights, they shattered the Raxian's last desperate counterattack. The 468 had done what the entire 88 siege army could not for years. Yet another breach had been blown open, this time in the inner Raxian defences. And this time, Krieg Command was not inclined to repeat the mistakes of the 30th Corps. Death Rider regiments began streaming through the gap that very same night, and the next morning, they began assaulting the rear positions of the enemy's defensive line. An assault corps was immediately vectored towards the breakthrough, and tank companies would be pouring through in the early morning light followed by mechanized formations of grenadiers mounted in gorgons and trojans. This time, there would be no masterful retreat orchestrated by Vraxian generals. They knew, as well as the Death Corps, that if they pulled back to the inner defensive line, everything would be as good as lost. The Citadel would be within range of Krieg artillery, and at that point, it would be merely a question of time until they were all dead. And thusly, very little, if anything, in the way of contingencies had been planned for. What followed was not a organized retreat, but rather a mad dash towards the rear and perceived safety, at least. Commanders would issue orders to their more fanatical followers to stand and offer suicidal resistance to the Death Corps so that their comrades may escape. In some areas, this was successful. In front of the 468th Regiment and the mechanized and armored formations pouring through the gap, it was not. The bulk of the enemy's forces began retreating towards the ruins of Hab Block 2 where they were swiftly surrounded by mechanized and armored elements, cutting them off from the last line of defenses. Over the following weeks, combat engineers and grenadier assault teams ground down the last of the resistant in the hab block. In the process, they had annihilated several regiment-sized formations. 
making this, by a country mile, the most successful Krieg operation on Vrax to date. Unfortunately, however, the success was not entirely unqualified. The previous week of heavy fighting, as well as the monstrous expenditure of artillery and the strain placed upon the logistical system meant that the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army was all but spent. The enemy was in full retreat and wherever possible the Death Corps was in pursuit, but it simply did not possess the strength required to chase down the enemy and launch an immediate assault upon the inner line of defences. Swift victory had eluded the Death Corps once again. On the bright side, whilst swift victory may not be possible, now that the defenders were hemmed into the smallest area since the beginning of the war, with any and all points of their remaining defences within easy range of Krieg artillery, the end was most certainly nigh. The Cardinal's forces had nowhere left to run, and they had nowhere left to shelter from Krieg heavy artillery. All that was left now was to grind down the last few fortifications over the next few years. And finally, the siege on Vrax would come to an end. Within the Citadel, the Cardinal's commanders were coming to that very same realisation. They undoubtedly breathed a sigh of relief once they realised that the Death Corps would not be able to launch an immediate offensive on their last holdings, as they were currently held by skeleton crews. It would take time for them to reorganise the scattered survivors of the second defensive line. However, it was scant comfort, as they were now in, essentially, an unwinnable position. The Cardinal himself also, after having been teetering on the brink for quite some time, finally withdrew entirely into madness. His mind had been yet further poisoned by Deacon Mamoon of the long years of the siege, and with this final piece of bad news and the apparent end now being merely a question of time, his fragile mind had finally been pushed well and truly over the edge. Utilising his skill, subterfuge and diplomatic experience, Lord Arcos, sensing the Cardinal was just about ready to agree to anything, moved in for the uh, proverbial kill. He swiftly replaced Deacon Mamoon as the Cardinal's closest advisor, and began indoctrinating Zaphon in his own twisted version of belief and events. He soon had the Cardinal believing that not only was the Imperium wholly and unsalvageably corrupt, the corruption stemmed from the very man sitting at the centre of it all. The God Emperor had abandoned the Cardinal, he had abandoned his last few faithful followers in the entire galaxy. And this was the man the Cardinal purported to serve? This man clearly did not deserve anyone's loyalty. Least of all, the pure, innocent, guiltless and victimised Cardinal. Zaphon had hardly been a beacon of light and hope for quite some time, but now he grew ever more reclusive spending days and sometimes even weeks in private contemplation and conversation with his new Alpha Legion best friend. As the Death Corps closed upon his final bastion, redug their trenches, recited their artillery, and resumed their slow, harassing bombardment whilst rebuilding their supplies of ammunition and reorganising their supply chain, the Cardinal was slowly but surely brought further into darkness. Lord Arcos agreed that everything certainly looked rather grim for the Cardinal, but there was still hope.
of a sort. Whilst the Imperium was irrevertibly corrupt and even the God Emperor had turned his back upon the Cardinal, there were others out there. Other forces, other gods even, that might be willing to lend the poor Cardinal's sympathetic ear, if only he would do as Arcos bid him. At this point, the poor, and in many cases innocent, people of Vrax had long since been condemned to death, but at the very least up until this point they had had at the very least a hope for salvation in that death. The actions of the Cardinal over the next few days was going to put even that slim comfort to rest. Outside, sheltering in their freshly dug trenches, Krieg sentries soon began reporting unusual happenstances. Storm clouds could be seen on the horizon, in and of itself not a unusual phenomenon on Vrax, but they seemed to oddly be centred around the Vraxian citadel. They also had an odd glow to them, and they seemed to rise and rise and rise slowly but surely up into the atmosphere. It stretched slowly, like some kind of gigantic, grotesque tapestry. And some of the sentries swore that they could see shapes moving inside it. Until next time, I've been Arch. And I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.